four out of the hundred participants in the just concluded Ukraine Russia peace conference in Switzerland agreed on a final declaration on June 16th. The key players, other key players, however, declined to sign that document, that communication that was calling for the peace between Ukraine and Russia. And what has shocked the world is the participation of India, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and South Africa, and United Arab Emirates. They have all declined to sign that document that was sealing the ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine. The communique reiterated that Russia's territory, um, Ukraine's territory integrity, should be respected in any case peace deal to end the war. Signatory countries backed a call for full exchange of captured soldiers and return of deported Ukrainian children. Ladies and gentlemen, the countries that have actually knocked down the document are very key members of BRICS. This include Brazil, India, Saudi Arabia, and China was an absentee in that meeting. And now the information coming from that end is that there were more talks but, but less solution. Let's look at something, a development that I want us to pay attention to. The President of Republic of Kenya, William Ruto, made a speech there. And that speech has unsettled this other side of the continent, Africa, on him making a position clearly about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it's, it's making a presentation on twofold. Number one, condemning the inverse invasion of Russia, of, of Ukraine by Russia, and also the seizure of Russian assets, which is a retaliatory strategy by the other European nations. I wanted to listen to this, but in this podcast, we will look at what the Western media have said and answer a very provocative question that most of us, and especially in this other side of South, do not really want to listen to. Was the war provocative and what should be the standing and why the standing of the Kenyan president, who is also was also one of the African presidents in that in the in that summit, is a big danger for the continent. But listen to the president William Ruto here. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been a horrifying spectacle of carnage and devastation, which has left five hundred thousand people dead and seven point one million people displaced in its wake. Across the world, people and nations are enduring the negative consequences of disrupted supply chains. Kenya's position has been clear and unequivocal from the beginning. Russia's aggression against Ukraine is unlawful, unjust, and a violation of the fundamental principles of international law which honor the sovereign equality of nations, upholds their territorial integrity, and advocates the peaceful resolution of all disagreements. Just like the war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East has been equally devastating. So is the case with the war in the Sahel region in Africa, in Eastern DRC, in Somalia, in the Horn of Africa, and of course in the Sudan. 40 million Africans have been displaced by the war in our continent, and 2.5 million kids are out of school. This state of affairs speaks volumes of global leadership, and especially the peace architecture at the United Nations, and more specifically, the gridlock at the United Nations Security Council. Today, a farmer in Kenya, in rural Kenya actually, knows there is war in Ukraine for two reasons. Number one, he paid more for his fertilizer, and number two, his fertilizer came late. 
This peace summit is a historic step in the right direction. For the first time, we have convened to talk about peace in Ukraine and not war in Ukraine. Secondly, a commitment to peace makes certain fundamental concessions inevitable. This summit should not be a meeting of just friends. This should be a meeting of both friends and foe to succeed in this positive trajectory. Russia must be on the table, number one. Number two, an American general, Norman Swarthfield, said, the more we sweat in peace, the less we bleed in war. It is time for leaders of the world to talk about peace, negotiate peace, work hard to build peace, and configure a global strategic framework that integrates peace as the sole means and end of human endeavor. We have gathered here and we are reminded by the Indian statesman Mahatma Gandhi, who said that an, an eye for an eye will make humanity blind. Just as Russia's invasion of Ukraine was unlawful and unacceptable, the unilateral appropriation of Russia's assets is equally unlawful, unacceptable, and a derogation from the UN Charter. And that speech has been trending in different parts of the world, by the way, not just Kenya. Um, I think even in this, uh, in this channel, the person who, one of our subscribers who reached out to me and told me, Kevin, you need to look at this video, was someone from South Africa. I think there was someone from South Africa and again Ghana. And was saying, I didn't know, I was asking me, Kevin, what about it? But there is a narrative that the Western media have really been talking about. And the reason why I believe the Africa as a continent, and even President Trudeau's diplomatic team, needed to tread very careful with this, especially in this table, is because Russia have its side of the story. But that Russian side of the story has not been given the limelight because of the Western media. The machinations of the Western media has actually not been entertaining the other side of Russian story in this conflict. And this is why if you listen to, I want you to listen to Kamala Harris, the Vice President of the United States of America. And the firm stand on this tells you that already the die is cast and it's about Russia is bad. But in this podcast, I have listened to some very uh, 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 serious um, uh, diplomatic um, experts on this matter. And I want to look at it blow by blow account. Put this the context of the Russian-Ukraine war. Why President Trudeau needed to tread careful. But first you need to listen to uh, Hamala Harris. I first met President Zelensky in February of 2022, just five days before Russia invaded Ukraine. An outrageous attempt to subjugate a free people and an attempt to wipe a sovereign state off the map. On that same day, I addressed the Munich Security Conference and made clear that the United States of America is a steadfast supporter of the principles that people have a right to choose their own form of government. Nations have a right to choose their own alliances. There are inalienable rights governments must protect. The rule of law must be cherished. Sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states must be respected. And national borders should not be changed by force. And nearly two and a half years later, I am here to reaffirm the commitment of the United States to these principles and our unwavering commitment to support the people of Ukraine as they defend themselves against Russia's brutal aggression. As I discussed with President Zelensky earlier today, President Biden and I have made clear over the past three years, we are committed to uphold international rules and norms to defend democratic values and stand up to dictators, and to stand with our allies and partners. This approach has provided for our security and prosperity for generations, and it continues to do so today. This approach makes America strong, and it keeps Americans safe. 
and this approach bolsters global stability. Russia's aggression is not only an attack on the lives and the freedom of the people of Ukraine. It is not only an attack on global food security and energy supplies. Russia's aggression is also an attack on international rules and norms and the principles embodied in the UN Charter. Russia is a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Nevertheless, for nearly two and a half years, it has shamelessly violated the core tenets of that charter. If the world fails to respond when an aggressor invades its neighbor, other aggressors will undoubtedly become emboldened. It leads to the potential of a war of conquest and chaos, not order and stability, which threatens all nations. President Joe Biden and I will continue to support Ukraine and continue to impose costs on Russia. And we will continue to work toward a just and lasting peace based on the principles of the United Nations Charter and the will of the people of Ukraine. President Zelensky, the United States shares your vision for the end of this war and an end to the suffering of the Ukrainian people. And let us all then commit to the imperative of returning innocent children kidnapped by Russia, returning them to their homes. Let us also agree a practical benefit of the work of this peace summit is to increase global food and energy security. And let nothing about the end of this war be decided without Ukraine. By contrast, however, yesterday, Putin put forward a proposal. But we must speak truth. He is not calling for negotiations. He is calling for surrender. America stands with Ukraine, not out of charity, but because it is in our strategic interest. We stand with delegations from more than 90 nations who also have a strategic interest in a just peace in Ukraine. Among us, no doubt, exists a diverse range of views on many of the global challenges and opportunities we face. We don't always agree. However, regarding Putin's unprovoked, unjustified war against Ukraine, there is unity and solidarity in support of international norms and rules. For President Joe Biden and me, it is one of our defining missions to uphold the international rules-based order, to defend it, strengthen it, and promote it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is very important. I know that the world in totality and everyone across the continent in the globe had taken a different a specific stand on that Russia-Ukraine conflict. But if you listen to different perspectives, you'll get to understand what, why this conflict is at a context, and that is why the African continent must trade very careful. And it dates back to the 1990s, um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union that allowed for reunification of Germany, into the NATO and by that time what actually had happened and allow me because I'll be I'll really try to refer to my notes here so by that time Mikhail Gorbachev at the end of that uh, Soviet Union uh, at, at, the, at the end of that Soviet Union the Warsaw Pact on that, the end of the collapse of that war, actually saw the United States of America, or rather NATO, signing an agreement that they will not move an inch even to the east. Because Germany had already been allowed to read for unification and be part of the NATO. So the agreement was the NATO will not move even an inch to the east. And this is the source of this aggression. But now a few months, not a few months, years later, NATO contravened that agreement and included Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic. 
These were dominated, these were former Soviet Union countries. And remember, that was the agreement that not even an inch, but the U.S. moved it. And there were different thoughts on some also saying that the documents were all, were all over, but it was not supposed to be agreed so. And so that was the first contravention of that agreement. Now, by the time, by the 2000, the year the 2000, George W. Bush um, Jr. with his president, with the vice president, who actually the makers of the Iraq war by then, and land NATO and seven more countries were added. These countries included Romania, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Slovakia, and Slovenia. But Russia kept warning that um, the U.S. is provoking them. So remember that was against what was agreed back then. And this did not sit comfortable with the Russia. Why did the Russia want that the neighboring countries, uh, those countries should not be part of NATO because that was part of their buffer zone. So I will answer a very critical question here. But before, before you look at, because there's a question of why did NATO, and that is what Nani is saying, that is what Kamala Harris is saying there, why did Russia, why did Russia feel threatened by NATO while NATO should ordinarily be just a defense, you know, a defense alliance? I will answer that question. So, but it's very important to get this into a context. In 2008, George Bush privately said, and that was one of the um, uh, uh, one of the summits that there were plans to include Ukraine and Georgia into NATO to bring Ukraine in Georgia, and this was a big problem. And Turkey and Russia, Russia had a big problem because by doing so, they were going to circle Russia in the Black Sea. When they were able to bring in Romania. Turkey, Georgia, Bulgaria, and then all of that, they were going to circle Russia. And, and Russia was feeling threatened. So they kept on saying, and that's why uh, the historians are saying that Putin said in 2008 Bucharest NATO summit asked the U.S. to stop. That was in 2008. Remember, that was nine years after Putin had, uh, been, had come to power because Putin was elected in 1999. So this development, this tension has been, it is something that had been developing for more than 30 years then. So 2010, something very interesting happened. And uh, I would really want us to pay attention to this. I was reading this and I think uh, I found this, um, um, I, I found this very interesting. So there is um, something happened in, um, in Ukraine. And Ukraine elected a pro-Russian president, someone known as Victor, uh, I want to get the name, Victor someone, I, I will get hold of them, I will tell you. And when they elected the, uh, the pro-Russia president, the president who came in power, yes, is called Victor Yanukovych. So in that 2010, when he came to power, he said, I don't want to be at war with Russia or U.S. And so he came up with neutrality, that I want to be neutral. And now there is something very interesting you need to tell the President Uta here. By that time in 2010, U.S. policy was, you are either with us or against us. So U.S. did not feel comfortable by the reign of Victor, you, it's called Yanu, Yanu, Yanukovych. Yes, Yanukovych. And what happened by the tail end of 2020, 2013 to 2024, there was the maiden protest. And is, the media reports indicate that the U.S. was largely behind the machinations to remove him from power because he was against the U.S. And remember, by that time, in between that 2010 to 2013, that was the time for Ukraine to redeem itself because... If they did get involved in, they said they declined that issue of NATO. But immediately, election was then done and another president was brought to power in 2014. 
you uh, the ukraine went back the discussion of nato nato came back and after that election the president that came back was then pro the us now that is typical to what happened in the country during uhuru in country kenya during uhuru kenyatta era uhuru kenyatta was seen as pro east but immediately ruto came hey kenya went us full blown so you see that election and 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 and, and that historian was saying that um, the us have the machinations of manipulating elections they have the ngos that will come with the manner of programs they will they will even provide the intelligence around this to ensure that they get they get their way and it is the same scenario to what has happened now that in this country after the 2022 election kenya has become a satellite nation of the us but there is also another lesson to be learned here from this uh, from that from that from that president from that viktor yanukovych because us did not want someone who is in neutral you are either with us or against us and that means that i have seen president tutu when was being asked about his position on um, on israel hamas war and was still also having that strategy of in the middle i think in foreign policy you will either choose you cannot be neutral neutrality and i've always said even news room there is no neutrality by the way there is no neutrality we human beings in every aspect you must take a stand in life you must take a stand and i think even in foreign policy policy it's not easy to say i am neutral i want this and this no the interest of those both parties are different the interest of both china and us are different so he cannot have his way and i want you to listen to how he fumbled when he was asked about, about that question these these are our interests your trip comes at a very turbulent time in the world and the united states is central to this turbulence that is playing out in the in the middle east there's growing public outrage over what is happening um in gaza in rafa the international court of justice ordered an immediate ceasefire and a withdrawal from rafa by israel a couple of uh, days ago the international criminal court issued our arrest warrants for hamas and of course uh, some leadership of israel including the prime minister benjamin netanyahu when you first came into office one of your one of your first stops if not your first stop was to israel in may 2023 you described your relationship with israel as being fruitful as being strong as being friendly but in light of these developments have you changed your mind are they still a friend Israel is a great friend of Kenya and we believe that that should go into the future. We made a very clear statement when Israel was attacked that it was wrong. We have also made a very clear statement when there were excesses in the use of force when children were attacked when there were atrocities you know committed uh, by against your against against, against uh, the people of uh, palestine we made a very strong statement that that was also wrong because two wrongs cannot amount to a right and we are firm in our belief of two things that the situation in middle east the situation in gaza cannot be solved using military means that's number 1 and number 2 we also are of the firm belief that a two nation solution is the way to go we believe in self determination we believe in the existence of israel as a nation and as a friend but we also believe in the existence of palestine as a state and and that is our position and and we we will not walk away from that that has been kenya's position that continues to be kenya's position in at the united nations it's true that you voted three times uh for a ceasefire uh, the united states blocked that move so there's a misalignment between you and the united states on on that you also voted recently for the recognition of the palestinian state You've spent a lot of time with President Biden. It's it's all very well to say we believe in the two-state solution, but when you are sitting with him, are you pushing strongly for 
an end to this calamity in the Middle East. Since the United States is seen as being central, it can stop this calamity with the, uh, the sale of arms. It is perpetuating this calamity. Did you say anything about that? The position of Kenya is known. It is not for me to decide. You are sitting with him it in is, the room. It is not for me to decide the position of the United States of America. Can we not tell your friends not to support a genocide? And our position has been very clear when it comes to a two-state solution. It is not a position that we acquired yesterday. It is a position that has been and continues to be Kenya's position, irrespective of the positions of other countries. You can see President saying, you know, Ruta saying, you know, we stand for both. You cannot stand for both. You have to choose one. And there is a lesson here that U.S. will not allow you to choose for one. So even if you come and say, I, I am this and that, it might not be allowed. Now, let me ask, let me answer the question on, um, let me answer the question on why Russia felt threatened by NATO. NATO was disguised as, you know, a, a defense alliance. But in real sense, NATO is a U.S. military asset. Not a military asset. It's a U.S. military market. You know, those NATO members, U.S. supplies them with the firearms. And it's actually an artillery by the U.S. Without U.S., the prefect of NATO is the United States of America. And that is why Russia felt it was not safe. What Russia had envisioned, and that's why the 1990, the 1990 deal was arrived at after the collapse of Soviet Union, was to ensure that those countries were going to be buffer zones. And just recently, Russia said they have uh, said that they have declared, or rather, they declared, um, they declared, what is this? They declared the U.S. their enemy, and they're doing the same, taking their uh, warships and submarines along Cuba. Now, in February 2022, just a month before the attack, uh, 2022, a month be, uh, just a month before, 12th, 12th January, before the attack on 16th, that was a month earlier, NATO Russia Council met at NATO's headquarters in Brussels, Belgium, to discuss Russia's military build-up near its border with Ukraine and Russia demands for security guarantees in Europe. So by that time, you know, they're already building up their military around the Ukraine and were raising questions. And, and Ukraine was actually raising questions. Now, the delegation there, despite of Russia announcement on 16th February, that military training in Moscow annexed Crimea land stopped and Russia announced soldiers had returned to their posts. NATO Secretary General said that it appeared na Russia had continued to build up. So while they were in the summit, they were saying that the soldiers are retreating back to their posts and they have stopped. But the Secretary General of NATO later realized that Russia was building up. And so on February 2022, 24th February, in the middle of an ongoing meeting in the United Nations Security Council, which was summoned to discuss the ongoing crisis, crisis and was presided over by Russia at the time, Putin ordered the Russian army to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, causing the largest conventional military aggression on a European state war state since World War II, and further deteriorating relations between NATO and Russia. NATO response force was activated and put on high alert. So what the other, what the global pundits have been saying here is the war in Russia, the African continent must tread very careful because this is a US-Russia thing. This is not, Ukraine is just collateral. It's just the damage. And why that NATO was not going against that agreement in the 1990s, maybe that one would have, not, would have not been there. And that is all you can see. Even the statement by Hamala Harris was very strong. Now, if you watch a couple of, uh, if you watch the international media, you will just get the one-sided story. And the one-sided story is on machinations on attack on the other Russian side. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is my take. And why Kenya then must tread careful is very important. Because 
on a matter of um, on on this matter, global geopolitics changes drastically, and our standing is bad as a nation. Our standing as a country is not good. And because the global geopolitics changes, we must tread very careful. Remember, even as we talk, there was a US election and uh, there, were, there were some allegations that Russia meddled with the US election. Uh, at some point, that Russia meddled with the US elections. I think that was the time that Donald Trump was elected. So if election happens in the US and maybe they change guard, what will be their standing? Maybe uh, Trump might have a different perspective of this conflict and might even side with Russia. So even as we, we make, I've, I've seen we are also giving some, uh, you know, green hubs for Ukraine, Ukraine here. I think we just avoid this because to what, to what expense? Remember even in Africa here, Russia has allies, hey? the Sahel nations. They are all over getting uh, military support and other forms of support from Russia. So we put ourselves not in a very good environment. And then dealing with America, you can't have double standards. That's what you also need to understand. And that is why I was giving you the historic, hist historical perspective of that conflict. Dealing with Russia, you can't have, the uh, America they can't have the double standards. You must choose which side. And with, in the interest of time, William Ruto will going to choose. And the Russian aggression is dangerous out even for local standing. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my take. And looking at this, Russia might see, look at you, the BRICS are out in it. They failed to sign the document today. They're not signing that document. And it's something that has really, really been created. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Let's meet in the next.